Hey everybody and welcome back to a new video. Today I had some extra time and I solved the headless machine on Hack the Box and I figured hey why not do a quick walkthrough of what I did and how to solve this machine. So let's just get into it straight away with an NWAP scan. So we're going to run a basic NWAP scan. We're going to do some service scanning, some script scanning uh, on all the ports. Uh, we see that port 22 is immediately found. Port 22 being SSH is not that interesting uh, in most cases. When you have credentials, it's obviously inter interesting, but not really before that. Uh, we also find port 5000 to be open, and that is quite interesting. It's an irregular port to see, something you don't always see. Now, eventually, if this scan finishes, and I'll just scroll up a little bit to show you, um, then we will see that uh, an HTTP server is running on port 5000. It's Python, WorkSerg, so that will probably be Flask. We see that a cookie is admin is being set here. Um, so that's interesting. But let's just visit this URL in our browser to have a better idea of what is going on. So in our browser, if we visit the page, then it's just a basic under construction page without much more information. Um, there is this button for questions, which links to a support page. So we can contact support in some way. And in fact, let's let's even start a, a support ticket here. So some bogus information and then submit it. And we see nothing really happens. Um, in my burp suit, we can, however, see that this does send a post request uh, with our data. So at least a post request is being sent to the server. Um, so what do we do when we approach this? Well, first of all, I'm going to do some more enumeration to see, are there any more pages on this web application that I've missed so far? And to do that, um, I always run, uh, or these days, I mostly run Ferox Buster scans. Uh, I really enjoy this tool. It's great. And if I scroll up a little bit, you can, I can show the output. So here we see the scan. Um, here we see it found the support page. It found the, the home page, but then it also found a dashboard page for which the response is 500. So we can, we can actually try to access this dashboard page to see that indeed we are not authorized to actually access the dashboard page. So. That means that, well, probably that is admin cookie has something to do with that page. And if we have the right is admin cookie, then maybe we can actually access this page. But I am getting a bit in front of myself or I'm running a bit ahead because right now we don't have any ways of stealing cookies and whatnot. We only have this contact or this support page, some support. And well, that's the only thing we can do. We can contact the support. And if we look at that support post request, we see that we can supply a name um, and, and some more and some other stuff, as well as a message. And if I quickly send this to the repeater, uh, repeater bugs out sometimes. If I send this to the repeater again, there we go. Um, then we can play around with this request. So one of the things that I always like to do when I have a page that says you're contacting somebody is to check if a cross-site scripting vulnerability is possible. This is something I always do with pen tests and it has given me some amazing vulnerabilities on great clients. So uh, maybe that will work here as well. So if I try to inject a script tag here, let's see what happens. If I do that, we see that it says hacking attempt detected. Um, and let's see if we can actually render this page. That's possible, yes. Hacking attempt detected. Your IP address has been flagged and a report with your browser information has been sent to the administrators for investigation. And then it shows the information of my client. So the method, the URL, uh, the headers, so host, user agent, and all the other headers. Now, this includes my user agent. So, well, I'm thinking, what if I change my user agent to be another XSS payload? What would happen then? Um, so let's try that sent this and now we see that uh, my user agent doesn't show here but if i look at it in the raw view then we see or in the pretty view maybe that's easier yes let me see here that my script actually uh 
renders or well, renders here, my script tags just get reflected back without properly being encoded. Uh, meaning that if an administrator sees this data in the same way, that this script tag would work on their system. So right now we are we have a situation where an XSS may be possible. We don't know that. Um, but we need to figure out a way of, of getting something back from this administrator if they actually see what we're doing. And I always like to do this with an image. So um, this is what the payload is going to look like. So as my user agent, I just have an image tag with its source pointing to my own IP address. I then put behind it a slash UA just so I know that if I get a connection back with UA so for a user agent, um, then I know that it comes from this request. So that's the, the setup here. Um, of course, I need a server running to actually get those connections back. Um, in this case, let's make it very simple for us. And let's just run a Python HTTP server on port 80. So I run that and then I can send this request. Now, of course, the administrator isn't immediately going to look at our payloads. So it could be that it takes a couple of minutes for this data to appear here. So uh, let's just assume that that happens and that we see a request to slash UA. Let's then continue uh, to the next part because if we get a connection back, then that means that our image tag was actually rendered on the website that the administrator is looking at. Um, so we know that we can render HTML. That doesn't necessarily mean that we can actually execute JavaScript. There may still be a CSP on that administrator view. We don't really know that. So that's the next thing that I want to go for. Now we know that HTML gets rendered. What about JavaScript execution? And one simple payload I use for that is to start again with another image tag, set the source to X this time, which means that the on error event gets triggered. My on error is just going to write to the document a new image tag with that same source pointing to myself again, this time with uh, the slash JS minded. So I know that if I get the connection back to slash JS, I know that that comes from this request that JavaScript execution actually works. So I'll send that request um, and let's see if we get any connections back already. No, we haven't yet, um, which is fine. Hopefully they will come. So great, let's assume that this worked as well and that we know that we can actually execute JavaScript on the administrator's end. What's next then? Well, at that point, we go into the exploitation of these vulnerabilities. And uh, this can be done in, in a couple of different ways. We can uh, either, or we can make requests as the browser of the administrator. So if we make a request to that dashboard and read the page, then we can steal the whole page. Uh, we could well, make any requests on the server that we want, but the easiest way to exploit XSS is if the cookies can be stolen. So let's quickly check that out. So on this page, if I inspect it, if I inspect the page and I go into the storage, this cookie is admin. It has HTTP only set to false, which means that if I run document.cookie, that the cookie actually is returned. Now, hopefully the same is the case for the administrator's uh, website. And hopefully that way we can, we can steal the cookie. So my payload now becomes, well, again, the uh, image with the on error. It's going to write another image to the page, uh, to the endpoint cookies, but then it's going to append the document.cookie to it. And then, uh, well, hopefully send the cookies to us. So I'll send this right now. In the meanwhile, we got our request back to slash JS. We didn't get our slash UA uh, request back. I'm assuming that that is because we sent two requests and it kind of got messed up there. Probably, uh, I'm not sure. But let's now fast forward this video uh, until we get uh, our cookie, hopefully. Oh, we don't need to do that actually. We get our cookie instantly in our terminal, which is amazing. So now we have the cookie of the admin. If I now take this cookie, let's see if we can use it. So I'm going to go to the dashboard and the dashboard, it's not going to work. Yeah. But what if we go into our storage and we change this cookie for the one that we just figured out or stole from the admin using XSS. If we reload, 
reload now, then we see that we get access to an administrator dashboard. And this administrator dashboard is pretty small. It only has one function to generate a report. It says the systems are up and running. Uh, we can change the dates here, generate a report. The systems will still be up and running. So let's look at that request. So the dashboard request, it's a post request to slash dashboard um, with a date and it then returns some data. That's interesting. How could we potentially exploit this? Well, in this case, what I'm thinking is, well, building a website health report, uh, this may be something that like calls a shell script or some weird stuff like that. And this is something that you need to test with kind of every parameter that you have in web applications is something vulnerable to a command injection. And in this case, well, let's try appending a semicolon and typing who am I followed by another semicolon. If I send that, then we see that, well, the systems are still up and running, but now we also have the DVIR uh, name here appended to it. So the user is probably DVIR. If I run ID, they will probably see, yes, we see um, some more information about our DVIR user. So a command injection is possible. And now I just want to get on with it and actually get a shell as this user. For that, I am going to use Ref Shells, an amazing website. Ref Shells. Yes. An amazing website that allows you to quickly generate some reverse shells. So you can see you can use Bash, uh, NetGet, OpenSSL, PHP, and so on. So you can really quickly get Ref Shells. Uh, you just give it your IP address. For me, that's 10.10, 14.75. Then let's use port 4.4.4. And now let's see what kind of reverse shell I am going to create. I am a big fan of the Python reverse shells, but for those, we first need to verify that Python is actually installed on the machine because else, well, we might execute these and have no idea if they're, wor if they're not working, what the reason is for them not working. So what I always like to do first is to just run Python dash dash version. Let's see what that does in this case. It doesn't return anything. So Python is not installed, maybe Python 3. And if we run Python 3, then we see that Python 3 does indeed work. So Python 3 is a valid command here. So now we can go ahead and actually use this reverse shell whilst knowing that at least Python is installed and that won't be the reason why it may fail. So uh, how are we gonna get this reverse shell? Well, I always run RL wrap. Aurora Rep is a great uh, utility for kind of wrapping connections. It makes sure that you can always use your up, down keys, that kind of stuff, uh, and then like go through your previous commands, even if the shell doesn't support that innately, uh, Aurora Rep will make it possible. Then we use netcat with dash L and VP and then port 4,444. So now we're listening here. We can go to our shell here or to our ref shell generator copy the shell the payloads and paste it in here let's now remove all the spaces with a plus just a couple more there we go and let's execute it it takes a while which is probably good because that means we have got a connection back i'm now going to run bash and now we see that we are D V I R, and we can now get the user.txt. So get that, then we have that flag. Awesome, amazing. And that is the first part of this machine. But of course, there's always more because we need to become root on this machine. And for me, getting to root in this machine took like five minutes. It was uh, the first, everything, the first things I tried, they all worked. So let's see if we can replicate that here. So one of the first things I always do when I get uh, access as a user is I run sudo dash L. Sudo dash L, it kind of, uh, as a sudoer, you can decide that some users are allowed to run certain commands as sudo on a machine. And in this case, it says that we are allowed to run slash user slash bin slash sys check as sudo on this machine. So we can run 
sudo slash user slash bin slash sys check. And that works. Great. Uh, but what is this sys check tool? It's not a default tool that's installed on every machine. It's not like a default binary that I know about. So um, what kind of a file is it? It's a born again, born again shell script, so a bash script um, in ASCII text. So that means that we can like cat it and see what it's doing. And indeed we can, so it's running a bash. If we are not root uh, or if the uh, is it effective user ID is not zero, meaning if we're not effectively root, then we're going to exit. And so I'm going to get a, a time with these commands. Notice that all of these commands have the full path. So we cannot change the path to something different and then execute commands uh, in that way to, to kind of bypass what binary is being run. They're, they're all using full paths. Um, okay, it's getting the disk space and echoing the disk space and load average. It's then going to be grabbed for an initdb.sh file. And if it says the database service is not running, then it's going to run dot slash initdb.sh. And this is where things get interesting because dot slash initdb.sh, it doesn't supply any specific directory. Like we cannot, as this user, override files in the user slash bin directory. If we could, that would mean that we could obviously just override the sort binary to, well, run whatever we want. That's not possible. However, in this case, the script runs dot slash of a, uh, of a script. We can control what directory we are in when running the script, and thus we can control that to be a directory where we can write our own malicious initdb.sh script. So let's do exactly that. So I am going to go to the temp directory because I know I can write there. But I'm just going to echo batch into initdb.sh. And now, if I run sudo auth user bin sys check, we see that the script doesn't finish. And that is because right now I am root. And in this script, we got to this point where it ran uh, dot slash initdb.sh, which is that file that we just created. And well, that made me root. And so now I can cat slash root slash root.txt. And with that, we have solved this machine. Um, yeah, so this was the headless machine, a pretty easy machine. However, uh, the name of the machine, obviously, headless coming from the fact that a headless browser was being used to mimic that administrator and looking at the website. Um, so I think this is a great machine if you've never actually like exploited an XSS, because I think we see in, in Bug Bounty a lot where people know that, well, an XSS, an alert is an XSS, you know, but people, people know that. And you when you have an alert, you report. But of course, in the real world, you need to kind of exploit it because or just Popping an alert is not really an exploit. In this case, it was a very easy exploit. We could just steal the cookie um, and then get access to a uh, in order account, an admin account. Then there was a very simple OS command injection vulnerability, followed by a, a really straightforward um, privilege escalation. Um, but still, all things that are very important to know and that I th hopefully. Uh, taught you something new. I hope you kind of enjoyed this video, this short little walkthrough. I know I haven't been creating a lot of videos in the last couple of months, so I just wanted to, you know, spend this hour of free time that I had doing something for you guys creating a new video. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, leave a like and well, I hope to see you in the next one. Take care.